I don't know if you have ever felt that you were too ordinary uh, for God to use. Too ordinary for God to use on a grand scale in life. And maybe you've looked at prominent people around you that have um, incredible talents and abilities, and you say that I don't have those dynamic gifts, I don't have those dynamic talents, and very honestly, I've been there as well with, with you. I, I felt that as well. I, I look and I see myself as just an average person um, in a, a world of extraordinary people at times. And to be honest, I think that is Isaac. Isaac is just an average person, an ordinary person. But I want to assure you that God makes it a place to do extraordinary things through very ordinary people. And as we dive into Isaac's life here in Genesis 26, I want you to see a story that may seem unremarkable at first. It really doesn't seem like it's a big story. You just heard um, Elder Ed read that. Um, but I, he wasn't as bold as his father Abraham, and he was not as shrewd as his son, Isaac, uh, son Jacob. But there were amazing things that happened in his life. Now, he didn't lead armies. He didn't interpret dreams. He was just an average, an ordinary guy. Yet, in his life, there was a powerful testimony that God was going to do something in him and through him in, in an amazing way. In this passage, what I'm hoping you see is that God's hand is in his life throughout his whole journey. God's hand is resting in his life in the fact that God's sovereignty guided him step by step through his life. We'll, we'll see that here. God's promises were a reassurance to him. You, you heard it multiple times that God was giving him his promises and just trying to assure him and reassure him. So his sovereignty guided him. His promises assured him. His protection covered him. We'll talk a lot about that, about how God protected him and protected his family and protected the promise that God had given. His blessings enriched him. God's presence comforted him. The harmony that God was going to provide him in his relationships, even with the world that was around him, and a legacy that was promised, a promised future was there with Isaac and then for his future blessing. So you'll look at Isaac's trials. We're going to see those this morning. We're going to see his trials and his triumphs, and we'll discover the timeless principles that I've given you on your outline, because I know that there were a number of principles that I just saw as they came out of this text. So as we embark on this journey, as we're walking here with Isaac, I want you to consider that God has a plan. Now, um, Pastor Doug last week gave you a map and I don't know if you have that map or the outline. I had it somewhere, and it's here somewhere. And if you notice, he's got this timeline from uh, the birth of Jacob and to his death. And then you'll see um, a number of chapters that he has on that outline up top. Uh, but then you'll see Genesis chapter 26, verses 1 through 33. And Doug and I hadn't even talked about this. He's got an arrow going way back over here. Because I guess we all know when it happened. He's got a big question mark. And I agree with you. And I agree with him on this. Um, even though it seems like it falls after Esau, because we talked about Esau at the end of chapter 25, you would think that it would follow logically that this must happen after Esau and Jacob and the wrestling and all those things and the birthright. But I actually think it happens even before there were kids. And I'll try to tell you the story. Yeah, I think that what is happening here is I think, he, I think Moses is creating a sandwich in his writing. I think he's talking about Esau at the end of chapter 25. And as you heard Ed read, he's talking about Esau at the end of chapter 26. And he's talking about how Esau was acting in sinful ways and wrong ways. And then in the middle, he gives you the life of Isaac. How God's hand was with Isaac in that journey. And he's... he's giving a contrast. So I don't think this is happening in chronological order. I think he's giving you a contrast, but I'll try to argue that as we move forward. So today we're going to look at seven blessings or seven ways that God's hand is in Isaac's life. And the first of, first of it I see is the sovereignty of God. We see this in verse 26, I'm sorry, chapter 26, verse one. It says, now there was a famine in the land. Besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went to Gerar, 
to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. So he, he sets the context. What he's telling you is that there is a famine, and it's similar to the famine that happened in his father's time, and, that fa- and it happened in Genesis chapter 12, verse 9. Now at that time, what Abraham did is when there was a famine in the land, he went to Egypt. And that was what normal, most people would do. If there was a famine in your outskirts, you would go to Egypt. And the reason why I think you went there is because the Nile River would run there. So the chances are that there would be more fertility and more, uh, you would have a greater opportunity to survive the famine if you went to a place like Egypt. And what you'll find here is that God's sovereignty says, don't do that, I want you to stay here. So I I want you to remind yourself that when you go through trials, and trials are common for all of us, when we go through these trials, I want you to know that we will even have trials in the promised land. And what God wants you to do is as you go through the trials, don't run right away, follow God's plan. And he's... Isaac is supposed to travel to Gerar, and he's ruled by this guy Abimelech. Now, if you know the story of Abraham, there was another Abimelech. I don't think it's the same guy. I think it's a different person. I think Abimelech is kind of like a title, like Pharaoh. There were multiple Pharaohs or multiple kings. I think there were multiple Abimelechs. But there was an Abimelech in Abraham's time, and I think there's a new Abimelech here. And so the principle I want you to think about is this, that God is guiding you. And I need you to trust in God's sovereignty. That God is sovereignly in control of every circumstance, including famines. Uh, He's in control of everything that is happening in this world. And that if you can know that he's in control of everything, nothing happens by accident, and knowing that he's guiding you through those paths, and that every situation that happens in your life is trying to fulfill his purpose in life. Sovereignty is interesting. We, we throw that word around, and many of us probably don't know what it means, but sovereignty means that God's reign and rules and controls his creation. And he is in control of everything from the grandest things in the universe to the smallest details. One of my favorite pastors, um, R.C. Sproul, used to say that there's not even a maverick molecule in this universe. There's not even one molecule that's outside of God's sovereign control. He, he wills what he chooses. He accomplishes his plans. Nothing Nothing and no one can thwart his plans. And so when you can rest in that sovereignty and rest in the providence, providence tells us that God is continually involved in your life and he is there with you. He has great plans to work in your life and he is orchestrating things. He preserves and he governs everything that happens in life and it's aligning with his will. So God's sovereignty was there, clearly at work in Isaac's life. I think you'll see that here, but you'll see it even more as we go through the chapter. So, so for you, when it feels like God's hand is hidden at times, it, it, sometimes you don't see it, I want you to know that he is, his rule is still absolute. I want you to know that every event that happens has been to his appointed end. He has a reason for allowing the things that happen, even through the difficult things in your life, the challenging things in your life, God has a plan. And you can trust his sovereignty. You can trust his providence, even when your life is hurt. You're being guided by this wonderful God who has great plans to do some amazing things through your life. He's actively involved. He's not this distant deity. He is in your life. He knows you so intimately, and he's leading your life in a good purpose, and what he wants you to do is to be steadfast in your faith. Trust his word, trust his promises, trust his control. So the first thing I see in Isaac's life is the sovereignty of God. The second way that I see God's hand in Isaac's life is the assurance of God. In verses two through five, it says this, and the Lord appeared to him, Isaac, and said, do not go down to Egypt. You hear the command. Dwell in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in the land and I will be with you and I will bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all of these lands. I will establish the oath and I will swore to your father, your Abraham, your father. I will multiply your offspring as the stars in the heaven and I will give to your offspring all these lands and in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. 
because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes and my law. And so what do you see there? You see God's command. God makes it very clear. He, said, he appears to Isaac. It's the first time he probably appears to Isaac. And he says, he's instructing him, do not go down to Egypt. And as I said, famine, people would go to Egypt, Nile River. Don't go. I don't want you to go. But remain here. I want you to do that. Now, there's a risk, very honestly. He, because human wisdom would say you would go to the place where there's water. <laughs> you don't stay in a place where it's famine. And so from a human viewpoint, he is taking a huge risk, but he says, I'm going to trust you, God. And God commanded him and did something amazing in there. He says, I want you to be a stranger in this land. And it's this land that's going to become the promised land. And so he's looking forward to what God is going to do in this land. Seven times in, that, in those passages, God said, I will, I will, I will. I will be with you. I will tell you. I will bless you. I will give you this land. I will establish. I swore. I will multiply. And it's like, it's so God-centered. It's not about Isaac. It's what God is doing for Isaac and for Isaac's children. For those of you who trust in Christ, you're part of Isaac's children. And, and God is promising these blessings to you. But he's reiterating a promise that he had given to Abraham in Genesis 22. And the promise had three levels to it. The first was, I'm going to give you land. So he's saying that this land is the promised land. He's promising this to him. They're going to get that land hundreds of years later. But he's starting by saying, here's the land. Promise number one. Promise number two is I'm going to give you descendants. I'm going to give you descendants that are greater than the stars. You're, as I said, you're part of those descendants if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The stars in the sky, the hundreds of thousands, of th hundreds of millions of people that are believers today and the billions of people over the centuries are all part of this promise. It's the land, it's the descendants, it's the blessing. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. Every single nation, that there is a person from every tribe, every tongue, every people that God has called to himself through this family. So here's the principle for me. I want you to rely on God's unwavering promises. Understand that his covenants and his blessings are steadfast, unshakable. When God says it, he will do it. You can trust him. And so that's is exactly what he's saying. I'm, I'm giving you all these promises. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Trust me. Trust me. God revealed himself to Isaac um, in a personal way, but he reveals himself to you and I with our word, in the word. And in this book, he reveals himself in creation. He reveals himself in our conscience, but he reveals himself in the word. In those 66 books, God gives you a revelation of himself. It's the authoritative word in your life. And as you hear the word, I pray that you would hear this as authoritative, that it's providing you guidance. It is providing you wisdom. It's providing you truth. It is speaking to you about God's promises, but also his directives for your life. And it is a place that you should desperately cling to. It should be a place that you should be reading and studying and meditating and desiring deep in your heart. But God can promise all these things, but if it's not for his almightiness, his, his omnipresence, his omnipotence, if it's not for that, he can promise all these things, but it will mean nothing if he can't fulfill it. And his almightiness tells me he can. He's constantly present. He's unlimited in his power. He's present everywhere. So that means that everything that he promises, he will fulfill. So you can have complete confidence in the assurances of God. You can know that they're grounded in his revealed word, but they're sustained by his almighty power. You can trust him. Number one, we see God's sovereignty. Number two, we see God's assurance. Three, we see his hand in God's safety. Verses six through 11. We'll start with six and seven. He says, so Isaac settled in Gerar, and the men of the place asked him about his wife. She is my sister. For he feared, if I say that she's my wife, thinking, lest these men shall kill me because of Rebecca, because she was attractive in appearance. So we see Isaac's fear. And Isaac's fear led to deception. First, it was fear. And he had a beautiful wife. Now, if this story sounds familiar to you, <laughs> it does, because... 
Abraham did the same thing in Genesis 12, and he did the same thing in Genesis 20. Guys, I'm going to talk to you in a moment about that because there's some real concerns here as men and as husbands. But Isaac feared for his life, and he was feared that these people would look at this beautiful wife and say, they're going to kill me to get to my beautiful wife. And so what did he do? Because of his frailty and his fear, what did he do? He, he gave in. And he says, lie to them. Tell them you're my sister. At least with Abraham, there was kind of some connection. Here, there was no connection. She's not his sister at all. And so there, his fear led to a deception, and that's us, you know. Our lack of faith leads to lying, lying to ourselves and lying to others. And for those of us who struggle with fear, we believe lies, we listen to lies, we believe lies, we even speak lies. And that fear can lead to lies, and it will lead to such poor decisions, and that's exactly what happens here. And the reason why I believe that this story happens before Esau and Jacob is because if, if, Esau, if they came into the town and he's carrying around two babies, they would already know that, well, he's got to be married to her. I honestly think it was just Isaac and Rebecca going into this town alone. And so they can pull off this ruse that we don't have any children because we're not married. You're my sister. And this deception, this lack of faith, is exactly what Abraham had done. In Genesis uh, 26, verses 8 through 11, we see the next step. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out his window and saw Isaac laughing. My version says laughing with Rebekah. So what if he's laughing? What's the big deal? I can laugh with a bunch of people I'm not married to. But, but that's not the Hebrew word here. Laughing means to caress affectionately. And so he's looking out his window and he says, Brothers and sisters don't act that way. <laughs> I hope they don't. <laughs> and he says, something's wrong here. I think this dude's lying to me. And he was. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, behold, she is your wife. How then could you say that she is my sister? And Isaac said, because I thought you guys were going to kill me. And Abimelech says, what have you done to us? Anybody could have laid with your wife. What? Are you kidding me? You know what's so sad to me? is that the man of God, who at the word of God, is being rebuked by a person who doesn't know God, is a pagan of this world. And, and that happens far too often at times when the world has a greater sense of morality and what is right and wrong rather than those that claim faith in Christ. We see that today. You know, it's like there are churches that are upholding pastors that are doing horrendous things and the world is saying, that's wrong. And the church is saying, well, I, I didn't think it was that big a deal. <laughs> and so sad. So Abimelech saw Isaac with Rebekah, and he realized that she was his wife, and God protected. So if, if, I, if I'm correct in the fact that there are no children, and God is looking to preserve a heritage through Isaac and Rebekah, he's going to look to preserve a Jacob, which the series is all about, through Isaac and, Jake, uh, Isaac, Isaac and Rebecca. If Rebecca sleeps with another man, the potential is that she could get pregnant by that man, and we can't have that. So God intervenes. He even intervenes in the life of a pagan, a non-believer, and he says, stop this. And that's what he did. Abimelech rebuked Isaac and said, what have you done? You, the potential danger that you've put on my people if we have given into this guilt. And so what I want you to know about this, I think the principle is that God's protection in times of fear and uncertainty, and I want you to recognize his safeguarding hand. His safeguarding hand is there upon those who trust in him, even when we falter. That's the gospel, really, to be honest with you. The gospel is that you fail, but God, Christ succeeds. Christ is perfect. He lived a perfect and righteous life for you. Even when you fail and falter, God's righteousness is there. And Paul in Romans said, the righteousness that, is, that he requires, he's granted to you in the person and work of Christ. But before I leave this point, fathers... Every father that's in this room, I want you to know this. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We have Abraham, famine, 
He wants to go to Egypt. Where does Isaac want to go? Famine, he wants to go to Egypt. That's not a big deal. But it is a big deal when he did this to his wife. And he did this to his family, potential family. You know, we as men and every person in this room do not determine what another person does, but we do influence. And we can influence people in the way we think, we can influence people in the way they speak, we can influence people in the way we act. So the way you think and the way you speak and the way you act in your home has a powerful influence on your wife and your children. And it can have a ripple effect. I don't believe in generational curses, but I do believe in generational patterns that can happen. And these patterns, if you're doing this as a parent, your kids oftentimes will follow those patterns. And Abraham, Abraham did amazing things, incredible things, things that showed his faith in God, but there were a number of sinful patterns that his children picked up, and this was one of them. So fathers and mothers, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, so I want you to be mindful of that. But then husbands specifically, I'm speaking to every husband in this room. What Isaac did to his wife was, was reprehensible from my viewpoint. He says, I want you to lie. I want you to take off your ring. I want you to claim that you're not married to me. And in doing so, he devalued marriage. He devalued his wife. He put his wife in, in harm's way. And in doing so, he is abusive. He's mistreating her. He's devaluing her. He's elevating himself protect me rather than her. Sinful. Wrong. And I, I, I'm going to give you something that I, I, I can't guarantee. But if you read the rest of the story of Isaac and Rebecca's life, here they're caressing affectionately and they're loving on one another. At the end, we see Rebecca holding fast to one child Jacob, and Esau holding fast, Isaac holding fast to another child. I see the division in their marriage that is there, the brokenness that is there, and I wonder if it didn't start here. Because he selfishly exalted himself, and in doing so, he potentially crushed his wife. It affected his family. So fathers... And husbands, if, if any of that sounds like you, I, there's nothing you can do about the past. What I ask you to do is to repent. Humble yourself and say, Lord, please forgive me. You go vertically to God and then horizontally to your wife and to your family. And you seek their forgiveness and you move to faith and obedience. You move to a place of protecting and promoting her because that's what Jesus did. Jesus protected his bride. He died for his bride. He sacrificed himself for his bride. And that is exactly what Isaac did not do. And Abraham didn't do it either. So principle number one is the sovereignty of God. Principle number two is the assurance of God. Principle number three is the safety of God. Principle number four is the blessings from God. So we see the blessings, verses 12 through 22. I won't read through all of those, but I want to highlight some of the ones that Ed read to us before. In verses 12 through 14, you see that in the same land, what Isaac did was he blessed them a hundred, blessed Isaac, uh, Isaac a hundredfold. There's a famine happening around, and there's something that is happening that he's giving him blessing upon blessing upon blessing. He became rich, and he became powerful, and he got more and more prosperity. And that's the blessing of the gospel, to be honest with you. When you think about it, in spite of his sin, God blessed him. That's what the gospel says. God blesses us not because of our up and down performance. God blesses us because of Christ. And every promise is yes in Christ. So the blessing that is there, Isaac's prosperity, the blessing, the crops hundredfold and the abundant provision of God. And God is doing this in spite of Isaac, the economic growth that he's experiencing. But look at verses 14 through 22. He had possessions, flocks and herds. But what happened? The Philistines, what? Envied him. 
the Philistines started to get upset with him. They would say, this is just not fair. And that's really what envy is. Envy is, is a form of coveting. Coveting is, I desire something God has not given me. Envy takes it a step further and says, you don't deserve it. So it points the finger out at the person. It's not just that I want your possessions. I don't think you deserve it, so I'm going to take it from you. And that's what, exactly what the Philistines were doing. They became so angry with Isaac. And really, it's anger at God, because you'll see that a little bit later. So what I really appreciate about Isaac, and what they did in their envy, is they started to stop up the wells, one well after another. And so the first well they stopped up was Isaac. And Isaac, in essence, means dispute or contention. So he named it. And what I appreciate about Isaac is he could have gone blow to blow with them. He said, no, I'll move on. He sought peace. And then he goes to the next well, and he, he digs that out, Sitna, which means opposition or error enmity. They stopped that one up, so he moved on. He moved on to Rehoboth, where there's room. See, instead of prolonged fighting, Isaac says, I'm going to trust in the provision of God. I'm going to trust in the promises of God, and I'm going to move forward. I'm not going to attack. Sometimes it's just not worth fighting. Sometimes we get into fights over things that are just not worth it. I'm just going to move on. I may disagree with you. I think you are treating me wrongly. I think you're treating me fairly, but I'm going to move on because I'm going to trust God is sovereignly in control in my life. Well, that's exactly what he did. He goes to a place of Rehoboth where there's no more opposition. He digs this well and there's some level of peace. And the principle I want you to hear deeply is this. I want you to acknowledge that the ultimate provider of all your needs is not you, it's God. Appreciate his blessings that may come with challenges, that he may bless you, but there may be challenges that come into your life. But persevere in faith. Trust him through that process. And when you do that, God can do an amazing thing because then he moves him into closeness of God. Verse 23, from there he went up to Beersheba and the Lord appeared to him again. That same night, he says, I am God of Abraham, your father. Fear not. I am with you. I love that. You, you know my family verse is fear not, for Isaiah 41.10, fear not, I am with you. Do not be discouraged. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. He says fear not so many times in scripture because we, are, we, are, we have a propensity towards fear. He says, fear not, I am with you. I will bless you. I will multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. And what do you see happens? See, I think Isaac gets a sense of his guilt, and then he gets a sense of God's amazing grace and abundant blessing, and then there's gratitude that's out of his heart. Heidelberg Catechism breaks down that way. Guilt, grace, gratitude. And I think I see that here. Isaac recognized, I don't deserve any of this. I have sinned against you. But he pours grace upon him. God, God pours grace upon grace upon grace upon him. And then there's gratitude. What does he do? This act of worship. Isaac builds an altar. He builds an altar to praise and worship God. It's a symbol of God's presence in his life. And it's a symbol of God doing something in him and through him. So that leads me to my fifth principle. Seek and cherish times with God. Cherish the fact that the God of this universe wants to reside with you, but not just with you. If you're in Christ, he, want, he resides in you. Where do you go from his presence? If you go to the heights, he's there. If you go to the depths, he's there. What is such an amazing blessing. So cherish those times. Respond to those times in worship and devotion to God. And feel his presence and let it reassure you, even as the trials of this life happen. Fifth way that God's hand is there is harmony from God. I'm sorry, sixth way, harmony from God. Verses 26 through 31. Now Abimelech, remember Abimelech had told him to get away before. Now Abimelech says, wait a minute, something's happening in this dude's life. I see something. Famine's happening. He's getting crops over hundreds and hundreds. We're trying to punish him and he just continues to prosper. This guy's getting too big. I mean, something's really concerning. So he says, I think we need to go down and try to make a deal with this guy. That's what Abimelech does in verses 26 to 31. Abimelech recognizes that God's hand is there. And why is this happening? Because he, gets his, he has a change of heart because he sees something different. He sees God's blessed hand on Isaac's life, and he says, 
I think I want that. And see, that's what we are supposed to be. We're supposed to be light and salt in this world. And so in the fear and deception that Isaac did earlier, he wasn't showing light and salt, but now God just, he's allowing God to use him. And the world is seeing something different. And so they come together and they have this pact of non-aggression. We haven't mistreated you, don't mistreat us. Let's get together. And they create this oath together here in verses 26 to 31. And they're making and maintaining peace. I think the thing I desperately want to see happen in our world, and we're not going to have it until Christ returns, is peace. But, but for us as believers, churches should be places of peace. Your, your homes and your marriages should be places of peace because you should be representing the Prince of Peace in your life. And the harmony that is here, they, they sit down and eat. We all like to eat. We're going to eat in a little bit after church service is over. But I want you to think about Isaac's deception earlier with such a poor witness, a poor witness of trust and faith and obedience in God. But, but his life, what God was going to do in spite of that was bless him. And now that witness that's coming through Isaac's life is a witness to the world. And even non-believers were recognizing that God was doing something radically different in this man's life. And that's why the importance of integrity is so important. We need to be people that are full of faith and full of trust and full of obedience so that the world will be looking because the world is always looking at you. I can guarantee you that. So my sixth principle is to embrace and foster peace in your relationships, acknowledging that true harmony comes from God and is a testimony of his presence in your life. Well, that leads to my last place where I see God's hand, a heritage from God. Verses 32 and 33, it says, That same day Isaac's servant came to him and told him about the well that they had dug and said to them, We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Um, Comes from the Hebrew word, which probably means oath. But therefore, he named the place Beersheba. Beersheba to this day. Now, it could be the well of seven or the well of of the oath. Either one could be. But there's a discovery of the well, and God is blessing him, and God is very faithful to him, and the lasting promise is that you can trust me. That's exactly what he's saying. So he's saying, I've given you my sovereign hand, I've given you my assurances, I've given you my safety, I've given you my blessing, I've given you my closeness, I've even given you harmony with others, and now I'm going to give you a heritage. And that's for you as well. For every believer in this room, that is for you. And so that's the conclusion of the story, that God's hand guided him. Isaac's life, through all his trials, through all his fears, through all the challenges, God's hand was guiding him. The same sovereign hand is guiding your life, or should be guiding your life. And all the experiences that he's going through mirror our experiences. We were tempted to be selfish, like Isaac was. We were tempted to be fearful, like Isaac was. We have challenges with other people in our lives, just like Isaac did. But the question is, do you hear God's word, and do you trust the God of the word? That's the you. That's the whole issue. See, God's sovereignty is over all the circumstances. His promises are unwavering. His protection is assured. His blessings are abundant. His presence is comforting. His peace is encompassing, and his legacy is for all of eternity. I've alluded to this throughout the whole message, but the only way we get this is not just this. It's the fact that the offspring wasn't just Esau and Jacob. And it wasn't this that it was going to go through the line of Jacob and then through another line. It was going to end up in a baby thousands of years later. That baby who's born to a mom who's a virgin. It is truly God and truly man coming together in this baby, in this womb. And and this baby lives a perfect and righteous life. The reason why I believe that he had to be born as a baby is because when I was in my mom's womb, I was a sinner, and so were you. But Jesus Christ, when he was in his mom's womb, he was righteous. As a toddler, we were sinners. 
but Christ was righteous. As a child and as an adolescent, as an adult, we are sinners, but, but Christ was righteous in every one of those stages for you. He lived a perfect and righteous life for you. And so what do we see? We see the gospel. The gospel is very clear. You need forgiveness of sins, Isaac. It wasn't that God just winked at his sin. He hated the sin that Isaac did. He hated the fact that he put his wife in those positions. He hated it. But he loved Isaac enough to take that anger and wrath upon himself. That's what Jesus did when he came onto earth. He lived a sinless and righteous life. He died on the cross as a substitutionary atonement for us. He, through his sacrifices, you are offered forgiveness. You could be free as well. It's not only that you could be forgiven of your sin, you could be freed from your sin. You don't have to continue the pattern of your father. You don't have to continue the pattern that you've been doing in your life. You can change. You don't have to be the person that devalues their wife or lies to other people. You can change because the Holy Spirit and God wants to come into your life and try to change you. So he wants to forgive you of your sins. He wants to free you from your sins. He wants to give you a family in God. He says, I'm going to give you a heritage. You can't imagine the heritage I'm going to give you. And he wants to give you a future. A future, not just today, but a future in all of heaven. Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection guarantees us eternal life if you trust in him. But I guess that's the question. Pastor Tim mentioned it earlier. Uh, we would be remiss in thinking that every single person that I'm looking at or every single person online knows Christ. They don't. Not every single person in this room knows Christ. You probably have heard the gospel message over and over again. It's for some of you, you've blind eye, deaf ear to it. I pray that that would not be the case today. I pray that as with Abimelech, I don't know if he ever came to faith, I don't know, but he saw something different. I pray that you would see something different. But clearly with Isaac, Isaac realized, I'm wrong. So today, if you have never trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray that you would call upon him. I pray that you would remind yourself of the fact that you will stand before this God who hates sin. Now you can stand before him in the righteousness of Christ, or you can stand with him in your own goodness. I will guarantee you that's not what you want to do on the last one. So today as we walk out of here, I pray that we walk out of here with a renewed confidence that God can do extraordinary things through ordinary people. I want you to walk away with this renewed confidence in God's unwavering hand in your life. He's a sovereign God. He's a God who gives you assurance. He's a God who provides you safety and blessing. He wants to provide you a heritage. He is a God that wants to do, bring harmony in your life. He wants to do amazing things in you and through you. Let him do that today. Let's pray. So Father, Isaac's life is uh, not very exciting except for you. I thank you for your sovereignty that you controlled everything from a famine in the land to the fact that Abimelech was looking out the window at that time. You controlled everything. You controlled that there was well water in each one of the wells they went to. And you were able to show that, you know what? My promise to my people will never fail. That's what you said to us. Nothing will ever thwart it. No person will ever deny it. Father, in this story, we also see that your grace is undeserved, unmerited. There's nothing that was there in Isaac's life alone that would have merited your grace. You gave it to him unconditionally, above merit, extraordinary grace. I praise you for that. And what happened is that when that man recognized his guilt and his grace, it led to gratitude. It led to worship. I pray that that would be our lives. I pray that that would be our legacy. Thank you for this morning, Lord, as we've heard these powerful testimonies. Thank you for this opportunity to be able to sing even this closing song now. Thank you for the life of Isaac, an ordinary person that you did extraordinary things through because you're an amazing God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.